Now, at this time, we are going to start the panel discussion. We are a bit behind the schedule. And I will introduce my, the panelists no, to the left, from the left, uh, Sir John Beddington, Professor Sir John Beddington. And then, and uh, His Excellency, uh, Mr. David Warren, Warren, the ambassador, UK ambassador to Japan. And Mr. Tachiro Suzuki, the base, base, uh, vice chairman, Atomic Energy Commission, and uh, Professor Hideaki Shurema of the uh, Tokyo University, and uh, Mr. Arimo, Tateo Arimoto from uh, JST, Japan Science Technology Agency. So lessons from Fukushima. How Japan should accept that? Uh, this is the main point of panel discussion. And we had a question from, uh, you know, corresponding from Times, a very tough question for how Japanese government handled this uh, situation. And first of all, I'd like to ask Dr. Suzuki, Vice Chairman of Atomic Energy Commission, and I'd like you to explain what the difference from Atomic Energy Commission and Nuclear Energy Safety uh, Commission. And uh, in this crisis, what they have been doing and what they have not done so far, uh, because I have just one, five minutes, I don't think I can cover everything. But Atomic Energy Commission I'm belonging to, I, our job is to give advice to Prime Minister on nuclear energy policy. And Nuclear Energy Safety Commission, we have a different commission. Nuclear Energy Safety Commission is in charge of the safety. And, and Atomic Energy Commission is in charge of everything except for health safety issue in terms of advice to the Prime Minister. And when such a serious accident happens, we have a law, special countermeasure law to deal with a nuclear energy disaster, which said that the Nuclear Energy Safety Commission should be in the position to give advice to the Prime Minister. And, 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 and based upon the presentation by Sir John, you know, I should say that I am a part of the Atomic Energy Commission as a part of government. And when I think about what's happening, I think I have two lessons. One is sharing of information. Already. You know, some media said that uh, they didn't have a good information available. But uh, which particular information was shared or should be shared uh, in what area? This is not the part of the stipulation of law. Uh, in terms of the information sharing, of course, information should, information should be secured uh, by a task force. And based upon such a decision, of the task force, Prime Minister should have a final decision. But we have to verify to what degree we have uh, uh, implemented such function. And the second thing is that uh, how fast and at what speed we have to share what information. That is another question we have, we have to ask. S some people questioned about, some people say that uh, you know, government has the delay, made a delay in terms of the uh, sharing of the information. But uh, you know, in some limited areas, I think, yes, we had a delay in terms of information sharing, which you have to reflect upon. And uh, energy, uh, Atomic Energy Commission, bef uh, before uh, we came up with uh, our uh, observation uh, on the 3rd of April, uh, we didn't do anything at all. The things other than the you know, aftermath of the, uh, uh, this crisis. So, of course, uh, we had a discussion on how we have to behave in terms of the handling of uh, this issue as a part of government. But the uh, conclusion we made was uh, because we didn't have any authorization, you know, uh, because uh, we didn't have any role given to us in terms of the uh, stipulation law in terms of handling, uh, you know, uh, this crisis. So that is another thing you have to verify. So that is for me. Thank you. So I uh, ask you, you know, deep questions later, but... So next, uh, Professor uh, Shirema from University of Tokyo, please. I have three 
points that I would like to comment on. First of all, as Mr. Ikigami mentioned, one of the major theme is risk communication. So government risk communication and the risk communication between government and the public. In the past um, decade or so, we have been working about uh, why do we have a problem of risk communication between the government and the public. But uh, if I look, take uh, a look at this, maybe scientists have various um, specialties. And among government uh, ministries and agencies, uh, unless there is a good communication, the government cannot be united in giving a good risk communication. So cross-functional or cross-governmental communication perhaps was not sufficient. And uh, we had a BSE problem uh, dealing with the beef import. And we set up a risk committee in Japan and the Ministry of Health, Labor and Welfare, and the Ministry of um, uh, Agriculture. Uh, and the committee had various communication. Uh, but um, uh, first of all, we have to think of the risk communication among uh, the government uh, uh, ministries and agencies, uh, as well as committee, and their interface um, for the for those communication. I believe is the uh, chief scientific advisor, and the scientists' uh, job is to say uh, say what they think about, and uh, they should argue uh, um, based on what we uh, they believe on based on evidence. So maybe mediator uh, uh, should play a very important role in thinking about risk communication. So before making external communication, within the government body, we need to have uh, you know, communication facilitator or coordinator to have smooth communication among agencies and departments within the government. And as Suzuki-san mentioned, in Japan we have a council or and uh, we, those councils receive uh, questions from the government and provide advice to the government. And uh, there is assessment and decision making. And in Japan, the assessment and decision making were so closely linked. As mentioned earlier, Maybe assessment uh, can be done based on science, but um, many of the decisions cannot be done uh, based on purely scientific uh, reasoning because we have to think of our economics and the risk trade off and the financial matters. Uh, in Japan, not only atomic power plant, but the food impact, and you know, can we leave children at school? There are various you know, risks, and, and we have to think of you know, balance and the trade off among risks. So that kind of judgment cannot uh, simply be done only by science. We have to think of various things. But uh, having transparency uh, uh, in the area of science is something that we have to do as a scientific assessment. And of course, at the uh, final decision, uh, politicians, you know, the, the government can, can make a decision. And in the case of Japan, it seems um, people people um, may rely on science too much. Uh, and people say that because scientists said so, we made this decision. But actually, that decision is not really made purely by scientific background. Um, so I think that having transparency of a role among politicians, scientists, and others uh, is very important. And the next point I will be mentioning is based on these problems, as was raised by uh, uh, you know, uh, questions, to what extent should we rely on atomic energy? Uh, if we, I look at France and Germany, the decision making done in those countries is different. So assessment can be common, however, decision making can be different. Uh, in country, so we have to establish a good a safety, you know, system or regime. And this is something that we can um, discuss uh, rather openly. And what's important here is um, um, it's, what's important here is independence. But talking about independence. Uh, can we have independence if we isolate a people from um, existing uh, interests? That is not sufficient. 
if I look at uh, Japan's、uh, case, we thought of uh, uh, earthquakes, but、uh, we didn't、um, put emphasis on tsunami. And you know, scientists can have you know narrow-minded view、uh, in terms of their expertise. So, how can we establish integrated group of、uh, various expertise? And、uh, there is a waste、um, material issues as well as decommissioning issues. So we have to develop people who can deal with those things, and、uh, we have to think of the career path of those people at the same time. So、uh, decision making in that area is also required. So I、uh, gave rather、uh, three points. So Arimoto-san, please. Well, I would like to talk、uh, the similar thing from a different perspective. Well. Government administration, scientists,、uh, engineers, and the group. So role sharing among them, and the sense of responsibility among them, and the trust、uh, which build, which support that. It seems、uh, this is not working well, and we haven't developed uh, trust uh, among those circle. And this is something that we should reflect upon, and I should reflect upon personally、um, as well. And in thinking of restoration of Tohoku region, we need to have a lot of advice from scientists, and to have good trust among people is a very important point. And what we can learn in this、um, area is the UK, as Professor Bedinto mentioned, and I belong to the RISTEC. And the science and the government's、uh, distance has、uh, shortened very much, and the sense of responsibility、uh, between the government and scientists.、Uh, these are the points that I surveyed in the past、um, uh, few years. And、uh, in the case of uh, U.S., uh, the degree of the science、um, of respect is different in the current administration and the different administration. That is a survey of Dr. Holden. And in the U.K., based on the Rosner Man. In last March, uh, uh, Professor uh, Bellington um, uh, issued a very sharp guideline, and the Germany also、um, uh, issued a guideline. So, in comparison to other countries, Japan is rather late or behind in this area, and including politicians as well as academia, we need to establish or prepare a guideline、uh, before fall, and、uh, we would like to initiate a discussion based on that. Um, but、uh, even though we may come up with a good system, the process of democracy and the culture of academia so,、um, uh, should work、uh, together with guidelines. So the both system and the philosophy must、uh, go hand in hand. So as Professor Berinto mentioned, at the peace time, we have to have good. Um, relationship of communication, and only then, at the time of emergency, we can have good communication. So I may be repeating myself, but、uh, as has been mentioned, there are various, you know,、um, scientists,、uh, and the scientist position can be different. You know, some scientists are,、um, you know, employed by the government, and other scientists are like a tentative advisor, and some scientists are completely independent. And、uh, there is like academia or society and congress. And as I held a workshop and as I talked to various people within universities and within academia,、um, uh, some people、uh, started to become very,、uh, you know, active. However,、uh, there was certain、um, atmosphere to. Uh, repress a such、um, atmosphere, but、uh, to foster the young people's,、um, you know, activity、uh, will be very important. So,、um, Ambassador Warren,、uh, would you、uh, give us、um, comment?、Uh, thank you very much for holding this excellent uh, symposium, um, Doctor,、uh, Mr. Warren.、Uh, would you give your、uh, view? Uh, let me say a, a brief word as a representative of the British government. Uh, it was extremely valuable uh, for us uh, to have the objective and independent、uh, scientific advice that、uh, Professor Beddington's、uh, committee、uh, was able to provide to the government as we took our key decisions、uh, during the crisis.、Uh, the primary responsibility of the British Embassy. 
uh, in addition, of course, to providing uh, all support that we could to the Japanese government uh, in its uh, um, rescue and reconstruction and recovery activities, uh, was to identify and assist British people, British citizens, who might have been caught up in the disaster in the Tohoku, and to provide advice uh, to British people living in Japan uh, about the implications of the disaster. Uh, that advice normally takes the form of uh, advice on whether it is safe to travel uh, to the country or to the region of the country affected, and whether people should continue to remain uh, in Japan. Uh, this is a political process in the sense that uh, politicians, the government, must take, must make these judgments and accept the responsibility for these judgments. And there will inevitably be a tension in this process between the danger of appearing to leave uh, people in harm's way and at the other end of the spectrum uh, precipitating a panic uh, by suggesting that the risks are greater than they, in fact, are. And it is the government's responsibility to make those judgments and to accept, in a democracy, uh, accountability for those judgments, bearing in mind that times of crisis of this kind are reputationally defining for a government, its politicians, and also its officials, like myself. We took a number, we, the government, took a number of decisions in the course of the week immediately after the earthquake, uh, linked to our own uh, activities to support British nationals in the area of the earthquake in the Tohoku. And a number of us went to the region to, to be of assistance to British people. The level of travel advice that we gave to our nationals and we raised the level of advice so as to warn against non-essential travel to uh, this part of Japan and to Tokyo at that time. Uh, the, uh, the, the consideration uh, as an employer in the embassy about whether it was appropriate uh, for uh, the embassy, as Professor Beddington said, uh, to close or to move or whether our staff should be evacuated, or whether their families should be evacuated. And later in the week, after uh, we had uh, slightly increased the level of our travel advice so as to reflect the need for an exclusion zone around Fukushima, and to suggest that people living in Tokyo might wish to consider relocating temporarily uh, to provide um, uh, iodine uh, to those who might feel that they needed it in the unlikely event of the situation deteriorating to a degree that imposed a risk to people living in Tokyo. Now, all those decisions were strengthened in terms of their accountability and proportionateness by being underpinned by the objective scientific advice that Professor Beddington's committee was able to give. Of course, the decisions that we were taking were not solely based on the scientific advice. They were based also uh, on uh, other factors which were of relevance, particularly the conditions in Tokyo uh, at a time when uh, transportation links were disrupted, when there were some food and essential service shortages in the immediate aftermath of the earthquake, uh, and uh, uh, also uh, at a time when there were a large number of power blackouts in the city. So we were taking a large number of factors into account in making what we thought, I still think very strongly, was an entirely proportionate response to uh, the level of disaster. And it's important in all of that that the uh, response of government at a time of crisis should be both proportionate and also should be consistent with people's own evaluation of the risks involved. Uh, because no government will wish to impose a, travel, a, a level of travel advice uh, which rapidly becomes inconsistent and, and, and out of kilter with people's own behavior. 
it's important if this system of advice is to have integrity and authority that it must also be realistic, which is, I felt, what we did. Uh, the point I would, the principle I would try and draw from that is to say that the, the role of the scientific advisory group is to provide that hard base of evidence on which these decisions can be taken, and the role of government, the politicians and the bureaucrats working together, as it is always important for politicians and bureaucrats to work together, is to make politically accountable decisions uh, on the basis of which British citizens can make informed judgments about how they should respond. Thank you very much. And uh, Sir John, I have a question to ask you. At the time this crisis happened, the US government, US government said, you know, 50 miles, you know, you know, they asked US citizens to evacuate from 50 mile a diameter zone. And Japan said 30 kilometers. Because of the difference between 80 kilometers by US and 30 kilometers by Japan, confusion was made in Japan. And US web, and at that time I looked at the UK web page, and UK web page said that uh, this is a UK figure which you have to respect. But at the same time, we have to respect Japanese figure as well. So, so this is a kind of a message I, you know, saw on UK web page. So at that time, what kind of judgment uh, do you think the UK government made? And another question, if you know, you know, I, 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 I hope you answer. What is the background of the 50 miles that US came up with? Do you, why do you think the US government came up with the 50 miles instead of 30 kilometers? Um, the, um, the issue really here is um, that um, I posed the question and explained the question that I'd been asked to answer, um, which was really should we advise nationals not to travel um, to Japan or leave or should the embassy move? The analysis that we did on some of these worst case scenarios indicated that there was actually um, in the immediate vicinity of Fukushima, there was uh, potential for radiation um, in the very, very worst cases to go beyond the 30 mile exclusion zone, depending on what the weather was doing at the time. Um, in fact, therefore, um, but because we had not experienced um, all the weather patterns that could be, it became very difficult to actually do that analysis uh, properly. So we concurred when um, that um, the US advice seemed to us to be sensibly precautionary. But in fact, um, the concern was really primarily about, um, re <coughs> about the situation of the very, very worst case. And as the situation proceeded, um, and when um, we were, it became clear that this cascade of nuclear um, meltdown in three reactors and, all, and uh, burning in all six ponds looked increasingly unlikely, and we also accumulated information about what were typical weather patterns, we, felt we, were able, we actually then advised COBRA um, that it would, as far as radiation concerns were were the case, that it would be quite possible to move back from the 80 kilometers to around 60. Um, the 60 was again something which, there was a potential if the weather conditions were particularly bad in the immediate vicinity and there was a reasonable, and there, the very worst case happened. So it was in part the, uh, supported by the scientific analysis, but it was also precautionary in the first case. Uh, I, I, I have understood, and I have a question to three Japanese people, and uh, uh, Professor Biddington said he thought about what scenario, and, uh, and he thought about what scenario, but, uh, you know, and, and even in what scenario, he thought the situation would be like this. Uh, but uh, judging from what the Japanese government talked about, I questioned to a degree they thought about what scenario. And, uh, it seemed to me that the Japanese government said that uh, no harm to, Jap to the people without thinking about worst case. And uh, I'm wondering to a degree, Japanese government thought about worst scenario, and uh, you know, to a degree they should have disclosed such discussion. And I have a question, and, and first of all, uh, Mr. Suzuki, please. Akuchuari. 
to a degree, they calculate the worst case. I was not involved in such activity, I don't know, but uh, definitely they calculate the worst scenario case, yes. But the problem is, as I, as I mentioned earlier, how quickly they have to disclose what information. They didn't have a clear criteria for them to do such things. So that is why, you know, in order to avoid panic, you know, they did what they did. So meaning that they, they had a delay in uh, disclosing information. So whatever the reason uh, may have been, if they lost their trust, of course, that, that is the thing they have to improve uh, going forward. Mr. Shirema, please. Professor Shirema. Basically, processes should be transparent. And that, you know, the process, you know, should be transparent to talk to the people what kind of decision was made by what type of, what kind of evidence. And of course, we have to think, to, you know, of course we have to think about diversity of the opinions and generally speaking, we have to have a diversity of opinions. But uh, when we think about what scenario, what kind of diversity do you think we have to have? That is another question. And what to do with such decision? So I think finally, you know, Expert judgment, balance of evidence, you know, the word, you know, used by, you know, Sir John. I think, uh, I think for that, I think to, to some degree, we have to have a dependency upon experts. So I don't think uh, everybody can just talk about whatever they think, but uh, anyway, when, uh, but uh, in any way, you know, you know, government has, should disclose what kind of evidence they use to come up with a, a decision. So balance of evidence. You know, me, you know, so meaning that the you know, government should disclose the processes they use to, to, to think to, to, to think about balance of evidence. I I, I I share the same opinion, almost same opinion to Professor Shurema, but in UK for example. And I hope Mr. Bindu can talk about this later. But uh, when I look at UK guideline the advisor, scientific advisor, should be independent and transparent, and that they have good, uh, you know, expertise based upon which they have to come up with advice to the government. But the government side, and of course, government should say that they should not make judgment based upon only such factor. Of course, they have to think about other factors, you know, economy or psychological factors, and in you know, considering every popular factor, government should make a decision. So. Scientific advising, scientific advisor, on one hand, you know, government, at a time when government come up with a different uh, decision, you know, different from the uh, science advisor, uh, you know, opinion, the government uh, should make a good explanation. And if government should provide good explanation, science, scientists should accept accept that. I think uh, in UK, you have already established such culture, but in Japan, we have not established such culture at all. So, you know, that is why we, we, we have a problem here in Japan. But uh, clear, clearly, going forward, you know, everybody should think about, you know, their own position, capability, but uh, at a, in any case, they have to try to establish a good transparency. But uh, you know, if they try to seek for good transparency, they may come up with a kind of confusion. But that is for well, that's a transition. And so scientists, you know, should give advice based upon pure scientific observation uh, to the government, and they have to disclose such information to the public. And uh, based upon that, government. Politicians should make their own decision based upon such advice, considering other factors. And uh, whatever the decision politician may come up with, they have to make them transparent, uh, meaning uh, that uh, they have to come up with a very good accountability. And uh, if this is the case, scientists should accept such decision made by the uh, politician. So do I understand that uh, in UK, you have already established such a culture? And uh, uh, so if it is not the case, you know, what do you think we have to do going forward in Japan to have such, you know, quality established? So this is a question to Sai John, please. I thought we had an agreement you asked me easy questions. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> well, I can answer the UK with some degree of comfort. Yes, I think we have established that culture. Um, 
I, we did talk about the BSC crisis when I think we did get it wrong. And I think things have improved quite, quite a lot since then. I do think we have a culture that scientific advice is by and largely accept it, accepted. But the, um, w the way that different ministries deal with it, when, for example, a decision is taken um, for reasons that are economic or financial or political, um, and, it's, and it, it's not in conformity with the basic scientific advice, um, the practice is that the reasons are given. And I can give you an example of that, which goes back to the uh, swine flu um, epidemic that we had. And um, the epidemiology um, indicated that you could slow the epidemic somewhat if you close the schools. Um, and that was correct science. There was no doubt about that. But if you then started to think about the disruptive effects that this would have, for example, on people working um, in all, both in the health service, in the retail, and um, all the other aspects of government who could not uh, send their children to school, the economic consequences of doing that were very, were very profound. And the benefits that you would get from slowing the um, pandemic were relatively modest when quantified in economic terms. And that seems to me to be perfectly reasonable. Um, there was no doubt that the advice was, yes, you would slow the epidemic if you cut back, if you uh, close schools, but actually the economic and social consequences, the disruption that follows, were profound. So I think that's a case where it is perfectly reasonable to ha happen. The difficult question, of course, is about Japan, because um, albeit I've visited this country on, a few ca on about five or six occasions, um, and I, I have heard what people have said and our colleagues on the panel about a different culture. Um, I, my observations are, um, are not very scientific um, in the sense that I just don't have the information. But I think that if there is, um, if there is not a culture of um, scientific evidence being considered before decisions are taken, then I would, I would think that they, there would be real advantages that change would bring that about. But I can't judge exactly what it is here. Um, certainly, I, um, I think that the discussions that, I've, that I have had with um, colleagues um, on this particular issue and colleagues in Japan have indicated there is a real understanding of some of, the, of, the, of what the scientific problems are. Um, but I think that um, the way this is a complicated issue and I'm afraid I don't have enough scientific evidence to comment in a proper way. <laughs> Understood. Thank you very much. The, as the government, for the government to make decisions, there should be certain, you know, um, processes and guidelines. But uh, if those are not transparent, uh, you know, uh, people are more concerned uh, about Japan. Uh, recently, there was a judgment of the Ministry of Education: the children in Fukushima, the annual exposure. Uh, should be suppressed below 20 uh, millisievolt per year. And that guideline was set. However, people started to talk that is too high. And then all of a sudden, Ministry of Education said, for this year, we should try to aspire for one millisievolt. Then people would say, why don't why didn't you set the standard from the beginning to one millisievolt instead of 20 millisievolt? When people started to you know, complain, the Ministry of Education lowered the gu guideline from 20 to one, uh, one millisievolt. What do you think? about the three pan from the three panelists. Uh, Suki -san. It's a difficult issue. Yes, uh, lack of transparency. This is the biggest problem. When, we, when people set up 20 millisievolt, there were certain scientific background. However, the accident did not completely uh, was solved. And uh, there were various uncertainties. And um, for people to come back to Fukushima and to live uh, in, in peace, there was a certain um, guideline. And uh, after you know the disaster is over and when things are settled, uh, when people come back, uh, there is another guideline we should you know, follow. And the guideline or standard for adults and children should be different. However, there was no good explanation given to the public. And the process and the decision making and the actual decision uh, always have to uh, be done uh, with transparency. And this is something that we should reflect upon. 
and uh, um, Professor uh, Beddington uh, talked about what we should think about social disruption, how we have to think of social disruption. If we s say that um, children have to bear a certain burden, then the, they may have to move schools, or, or if we change the standard between the adults and children, or then the children may have to leave a certain site. And this may cause some social disruption as well as mental uh, issue. And how, if we are to think of such thing, Uh, you know, we can uh, differentiate the standard for adults and children. However, we didn't uh, set um, target in such a way. And talking about 20 mil seaveld, um, they said that uh, alala was used as low as possible. That's what the government said. What it means is that, uh, you know, the uh, level uh, should be different depending on the person. So it should go down as much as possible. Depending on the individual um, situation, of course, you have to think of the acceptable uh, range of exposure. And um, maybe the ministry was also, uh, obliged to say that uh, for uh, elderly people, you have to set this, and for younger people, you have to have such um, um, standard. In the case of elderly people, if uh, you have to move them, uh, this will be burdensome for them. So it's not so advisable to um, transfer uh, people. And for children, there is a possible risk of moving schools and a sufficient explanation needed to have been given to people. However, that was not done properly. So there is a trade-off. Uh, moving children uh, has a trade-off, and uh, such trade-off should be sufficiently explained. Okay, Mr. Uh, Dr. Arimoto. I will be repeating what the two um, doctors said, uh, panelists said. For this kind of topic, uh, to do a case study uh, sufficiently is very important. When uh, the standard was set for school a uh, schoolyard, uh, one um, scientist advisor to the government uh, uh, quit. And we should know uh, what uh, really happened at that time. And uh, we should have data uh, so that we can uh, verify in the future about the decision of a 20 micro sievelt um, standard for schoolyard. Um, because by having data and by analyzing data, verifying data would bring a very valuable information. So that's a very important point. And uh, at the time of setting 20 micro sievelt, there was a um, you know, disagreement uh, of their uh, opinion uh, between the um, professor and the government side, and that is why the professor resigned, you know, voluntarily. So uh, we should uh, we should have you know good record of what really happened at that time. Yes, when the um, professor left, he was about to hold a press conference, and the government side told him you should um, have the confidentiality. That is why he had to cancel to hold the press conference. Yes, there I understand there is confidentiality in him, the professor. However, at the same time, what what kind of discussion took place within the government? This has to be verified sooner or later. Otherwise, people are totally irresponsible. I understand a certain discussion has to be done behind the door, but uh, at a certain uh, time in the future, uh, such discussion should be disclosed. Um, only then uh, people can feel the responsibility about their role. So just, you know, uh, trying to uh, shut uh, the professor's mouth uh, by just saying the confidentiality uh, is not reasonable. And the people should have a discussion uh, bearing in mind that, that their discussion will be disclosed sometime in the future. And having said that, I have a question to Professor Beddington. So um, the specialist. Um, uh, you know, had a discussion. I tried to avoid a difficult question. So various um, scientists had a discussion. And uh, Professor Beddington, I understand you are not specialist in atomic um, energy. Um, and yet, 
you had a position to summarize the views of the experts of you know atomic um, uh, energy. And uh, was there any, you know, in a, uh, objection um, about you summarizing the discussion? What is the respect situation among scientists? The, um, as I set out in my um, presentation this afternoon, that I have a, arguably a rather, um, in rather too large responsibility to all science and engineering in the United Kingdom. Um, and I think the, um, the key here is that um, I do believe the scientific method does enable you to make judgments about scientific evidence and that when you chair meetings, you would be, I would chair meetings to see that there was a consensus of the views. Um, clearly, um, albeit I'm not a nuclear engineer, I, do, I can understand um, the physics and I can understand the mathematics and, the, and so on. So I think that in terms of actually being a spokesman, I think that um, certainly the SAGE committee were completely content that I should actually speak on their behalf. And I think that um, the process I, I went through was to say, my understand I would say something like, my understanding is that the analysis you produced provides the following recommendations, and then I would check that with the committee, and that would be the advice that I would give to government. So that, um, in a sense, we, I was getting a buy-in from members of the committee that they were content that I was able to sort of convey the, um, the messages from them. Um, I think that um, I, uh, I would never seek to claim to be a spokesman for the scientific committee, the scientific uh, world, or the engineering world in the United Kingdom. You know, there's obviously an enormous diversity of opinions, and it's not just me. But in the context of a SAGE, or indeed another committee where we might be making recommendations to government, I think it's just the proper business of chairing a committee that you would try to actually summarize your view of what has actually happened and what the, where the discussion has led, and then having summarized that, say, does, are people content with that summary? And if they are, then I feel confident to actually present it. I think that... Um, that is probably the, uh, the best one can do. Um, what we also um, do, uh, do allow, and that I think again goes to the discussion of transparency, is that any of the members of the SAGE group can choose to speak to the media themselves. Um, they, there is no control over that. They're welcome to do so. Um, the only thing that we ask of them is to say, when they're speaking to media, they indicate that they are not speaking on behalf of SAGE, that they are speaking on their own personal accounts. So that if someone, and this has felt that, for example, an explanation I might have given on, the, um, on a radio or a TV interview was not sufficient, and they wanted to go on and explain why it was insufficient or uh, additional points of view, they would be completely entitled to do that under, uh, under our um, regulations. And indeed, that applies to our science. We have uh, not just science advisory groups in emergency in the United Kingdom. We have about 60, somewhere between 60 and 70 science advisory groups and councils that report to different ministries. And each one of those there is a code of practice that, I've, that has been developed and what can do, and part of that code of practice is that they have the right to actually speak to the media, um, uh, both themselves, and, but also as individuals, as long as they make it clear that they're not speaking on behalf of the committee. So it is a very transparent process, and I think that um, that is the right way to go. And obviously, the, um, I, th I think that there, were, you know, I would endorse some of the comments that uh, my colleagues here on the panel are saying is that transparency is really important, and I think that this is the right way to go. I have, I have another question to Sir John and other three Japanese uh, people. At the time when we have such crisis, accidents, we have to think about jargon, you know. Science, I think we have translation between scientific jargon and uh, normal language. At the time when we have a press conference, they use jargon and uh, you know, normal people couldn't understand the jargon. Of course, scientists use their own language, special technical languages. But, uh, you know, many people or many government people are not the scientists. So if this happens, you know, there is a kind of a gap of understanding between scientists and non-scientist people. So going forward, you know, 
at the time when they speak to the people who are not so familiar with scientists, what do you, what kind of communication do you think a scientist have? So first of all, and a question to to, to Ms. Benidon, uh, Sir, Sir John, please. You raise an important point, and, and I think that the um, people are. Some scientists are good at this. Some are not so good. Some scientists are only comfortable about talking when they actually operate and using technical terms and so on. But I think there are also many scientists who are quite comfortable putting the putting scientific ideas in the in the sort of terms that actually are under, readily understandable by the by the general public. And I think that is part of the of the sort of it's part of the job I have. I have to be able to explain uh, without using jargon. And um, when I have to, for example, explain to a minister what a millisievert is, um, which is not that easy, <laughs> um, one can actually characterize it in a way that is fairly plain and simple. And you can say that this many millisieverts is the, um, is, the, is the actual radiation dosage that actually is received for just living a normal life in a particular country. And I think that um, that that is the sort of way that we should seek to do it. And I do agree that there are problems when people talk in jargon. And I think it's particularly problematic when um, there is a sort of discussion with some disagreement because it's very hard for the general public to do it. What I try very hard myself to do, and I try to encourage other, my chief scientific advisors in all the other government departments, is to make certain that they are confident about um, providing information and uh, I have a, may I tell a funny story? Yeah. Well, one of the jobs, uh, when I uh, was interviewed for the, um, for the job to become chief scientific advisor, one of the tasks they set me was they gave me something about pollution in the water system um, and said, here, you have, here is the problem, you have half an hour, and then you will be interviewed by one of, one of the four very fierce radio interviewers we have in the United Kingdom. And... Um, so uh, I, I went through this, and I asked this lady, um, did I do well? And she said, you made a big mistake, because she said, when you answered me, you didn't look into my eyes. <laughs> and I said, it's the radio. <laughs> and it was a very good tip, because she said that the quality of your voice changes if you actually look into somebody's eyes and you sound like you're reading something, um, it's very dull. So that was a very good tip, which I've used. <laughs> I think, uh, you know, uh, for example, Chief Cabinet Secretary and Prime Minister, you know, I don't know whether or not they're looking into the eyes of people. It seems that their eyeballs are moving. You know, I think, uh, you know, general public are very much sensitive about, you know, uh, the stance, you know, uh, you, know, you know, attitude by the politicians. So, Mr. Arimoto, it's a turn. So, scientists, scientific background, enduring background people, you know, I think that should be involved into the discussion of the uh, education, scientific engineering education uh, in Japan, junior high school, senior high school, and the university, you know, you know, everything is vertically divided based upon their own, you know, specialty. And uh, they when they go through such education process, and uh, you know, they, they they become a scientist. But uh, you know, it's often said that they don't have, have a social literacy, meaning that, that they cannot, uh, you know, talk to the people in general in a good way. So not only nuclear uh, scientists, but uh, you know, biotechnology or nanotechnology. You know, I think we will have such, you know, such issues. Bridging science and society is a key word in the world. How to bridge between science and society? So, of course, you can think about reforming the pure scientist engineering, but we have to develop a people who can be a bridge between scientific world and general, you know, public. So I think that is another thing I have to think about. Professor Shurema, please. In a way, this is uh, you know, kind of anthropology, anthropology, a part of anthropology in a way. Risk of communication is important among different agencies, different domains, different ministries. You know, scientists and non-scientist people, big between the two. But uh, I'm not a scientist, you know. 
But I think what I can, what I can say is that, uh, you know, sometimes we have miscommunication even among scientists. You know, scientific, science, scientific, scientific process people, you know, looked at the, uh, you know, you know, breaking of the piping of the Mihama power plant. That was a, you know, corrosion issue. But even for such case, you know, scientists didn't understand to each other, even among scientists. And, uh, you know, so sometimes they had a kind of mistrust, you know, against other scientists, saying that you are from, are you from police, something like that. So I think, uh, you know, gap bridging between the two, you know, scientists, non-scientists is quite important. But we have to think about miscommunication among scientists, meaning that uh, having a good bridge among different domains of scientists is another very important issue, which I think should lead to social literacy. But, uh, you know, uh, as a researcher, can you conduct daily conversation with a researcher sitting next to you? That is another issue we have to think about. Yes, I concur with uh, uh, other uh, panelists, but uh, if I talk more realistic things or programmatic things, among scientists, uh, we cannot uh, maybe communicate well. And perhaps because we have little opportunity to talk to um, scientists who belong to other specialty. So, um, such communication uh, is not sufficient on a day-to-day -day basis. So when it comes to important issues, I think uh, cross-specialty discussion or communication on a day-to-day -day basis, I believe, is very important. Now that uh, we are at this uh, position that it's too late for us to you know, uh, go through training, but uh, we have to be very active in um, uh, attending various uh, meetings and so on and to be active in giving uh, remarks. This is an English question from Twitter. To whom I should ask this question? Is it to uh, Professor Bellington or other three uh, panelists? Uh, Japanese government, as for the hotspot, hot spot, Japanese government should uh, detect the hot spot of radioactivity covering 300 kilometers uh, radius from the um, atomic power plant. And what do you think about this view, suzuki -san. Well, this is not something po possibly done only by the Japanese government. The monitoring requires international cooperation, and actually that is already uh, started. And it's important to uh, try to uh, monitor at the wider area. However, the most crucial thing is to uh, monitor the peripheral area or the near uh, uh, neighborhood of the atomic power plant. Uh, but uh, there is an international monitoring network, so we would like to continue monitoring using that network. And another question, perhaps this is a difficult or challenging question, uh, for the question from the Twitter. Let's assume when the leader does not have um, good um, good characteristic uh, to whom to do re resort to, and uh, should we disclose that to the media? I wonder about whom he, uh, that this questioner is talking about. The three Japanese panelists may find it difficult, but uh, Dr. Bellington, what do you think? Understand the question. Pose it again. <laughs> uh, let's assume a leader does not have a good a gift or good disposition or enough, you know, expertise. Uh, to whom should you give give advice as a scientist? When the leader is not qualified enough, you know, to uh, what should you do? Um, there's a democratic process, and I don't think it's appropriate to be commenting like that as in my role as chief scientific advisor. But I think the absolute key thing is that government as a whole um, commits to using evidence in developing its policy. And that's what the UK government has done, and the current government, and the previous government, and the government before that. So I think that that commitment that you will use evidence um, by government, and that when you don't use that evidence, you explain why you haven't, is the, uh, is the basic protection, irrespective of uh, individual leaders. And I think that 
Um, most of, uh, of the OECD governments are cabinet government, so there is obviously discussion and debate in such situations. I obviously, um, I, I've never encountered an issue that um, a senior politician has not been able to actually understand what I, the, um, the scientific case. And again, we go back to the importance that you don't use jargon and so on. Understood. Well, actually, uh, we we passed the 4:30, uh, but um, uh, last but least, but but last but not least, I would like to receive comments from five panelists. Uh, so, message to the floor, please. Uh, first, from Arimoto-san, please. As I have been mentioning. So government, uh, science, science and administration, or scientists uh, within the government, or the scientists uh, outside the government, uh, scientists in the scientific um, congresses, academia, there should be a role sharing uh, to be played and uh, uh, good communication or the good linkage among uh, them is very important. And the code of conduct among them um, those points should be discussed within Japan, and uh, we have to have um, a good code of conduct uh, within Japan because it's a very important point, and I would like to um, have a discussion with all of you moving forward. This is a point that was uh, mentioned by um, Dr. Suzuki earlier, but uh, uh, various uh, issues are very complicated issues, including the Fukushima issue. And the uh, layers of human networks, I believe, is very important. And us standing here, uh, we may be too senior, but uh, we have to build such layers of uh, people. Otherwise, we will have you know, challenging situation moving forward. So human development uh, is a very important point. And Suzuki-san, please. What I would like to say are two folds. First, as Dr. Kurokawa mentioned, we need to thoroughly verify the accident, and uh, we should do so, uh, which uh, can be understood by the international society and the atomic um, power uh, plant or the atomic energy uh, needs to be assessed and um, evaluated uh, comprehensively, uh, independently. Otherwise, we will not be able to make uh, another step decision. Well, I would also like to say one thing to Suzuki-san. As the um, committee, uh, Atomic uh, Energy Commission, you know, Atomic Energy Commission only handles things uh, other than safety. Now, I wonder that, you know, is okay or not. I believe Atomic Energy Commission and Safety Commission should work hand in hand. And Professor Whittington, please. I think it's um, it's always dangerous to comment about the structures in other in other governments, but I think the um, it's quite clear that um, the, way, the way one should approach nuclear issues um, is is three, many fold. First of all, is um, is the development of nuclear power an appropriate way to actually address the problem of greenhouse gas emissions and energy security? And that involves one set of people, and it's an appropriate um, set of questions. The second is, if you are going to develop it, nuclear power, um, you must be getting information on the level of safety and the designs, and that um, what we have in the UK, I think, works rather well, is that uh, designs of new, new nuclear plants are submitted to our regulator, and then they are properly reviewed and questions are posed about it. And I think that's a practice that um, I would strongly endorse. Um, in terms of a particular um, bureaucratic or institutional structure, things will vary within different countries, but quite clearly, the issues of the um, of how we actually assess whether a particular proposal for building a plant on a particular location is done, that has to be a, a proper safety case and one has got to assep, assess it in that context. I think that the other issues which are coming in for that, because there will be other issues, for example, the safety, one would be posing safety not just about um, the potential for some um, problem with the reactor itself, but you know the health of the workers, the, the standards for that, and all of these have to have appropriate assessment from a scientific point of view. I think the way in which that's done within different institutions is very much a question for the country, for the uh, country concerned. 
では、ウォレン大使。So, um, Ambassador Warren, please. Thank you very much.、Um, the, the last point I wanted to make is really to echo the point that、uh, Sir John Beddington made a second ago about the democratic process, whereby governments take, make these judgments on the basis of objective advice. It is really important to understand that this has to be a democratic process, that governments are accountable, that the decisions they take have to be subject not just to immediate. Uh, accountability, but also retrospective audit. So people have to understand how they took these decisions. And that requires all parts of that process the politicians, the bureaucrats, the experts, the media,、uh, the other social organizations to understand how that process works. It's really important, I think, in my country and in every country, that the accountability of that process is clearly understood and that the respective parts of that process. ありがとうございました。Japanese foreign minister is doing, ministry is doing at a time when we see coup d'etat or civil war in other countries. Of course, the government should come up、uh, with advice to Japanese nationals、uh, in those countries through the embassies in those countries. O- also,、uh, you know, foreign ministry comes up with information on the situation of each country. But uh, uh, at a time when you know, other crises, Take place in you know, a nuclear power plant accident or you know, swine flu accident happens in other countries. Do you think the Japanese government can come, can come up with an accurate scientific advice? You know, so, this is one lesson I obtained from this seminar. And、uh, another thing is that、uh, in the UK, you know, the government had the experience of losing trust because of BSE issue. And、uh, Professor Crocker said UK took、uh, 20 years to regain such trust. So, you know, Japan has lost. You know, trust in many you know,、uh, respects this year. And it takes a long time for Japan to recover such trust. I'm wondering which is、uh, quicker, you know, Fukushima plants getting stabilized or Japanese government you know, regaining trust. It's a kind of black joke, but that is another issue. And the third thing is that the scientific you know, issues, how accurately you know, scientific advices can be conveyed, conveyed to. People or politicians. And of course, you know, sometimes we have disagree- disagreements even among scientists. So if this happens, you know, you know, how we can have a good facilitator in each organization so that you know, we can fill the gap you know, over such disagreements? So such a system we have to have、uh, in Japan. So in that respect, we need to develop a person like a Sir John in Japan. It's kind of mini Sir John Beddington, so to speak. Or, you know, you know、uh, so, uh, and as a, as a whole country, you know, whole government, we need to establish, develop people you know, like、uh, you know, you know, Sir John Beddington for Japan, anyway, going forward. That is another important issue we have to think about going forward as Japan. Thank you very much for your participation for the seminar. Long time. Thank you very much. Sir John、uh, Beddington. And the panelists and、uh, Mr. Ikegami, you know, thank you very much for your very good skill of handling such、uh, difficult issues in an understandable manner. And、uh, at this time, we are going to close、uh, this joint symposium by British Embassy and GRIPS. And、uh, please, once again, give a big clap to, to the people, panelists on the stage.